Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Parkgate Community Church. I'm Pastor Chelsea, and we're so glad to have you here for worship with us this morning. If you're here for the very first time, we want to encourage you to fill out that connection card that's on the bottom of your weekly tear-off uh, in its entirety so that we can send you a little something in the mail to thank you for being here. If you are here on a regular basis, we'd still love to have you fill that out so we can know you're here and know ways that we can be praying for you this week. You can turn those into the boxes in the back at the end of service. If you're watching online, you can fill out the digital version. There's a link there for you. We have a special treat today after church, after second service, that is. We have our impact students hosting a hot dog fundraiser. All proceeds from that are going towards summer trips. So maybe change your lunch plans up a little bit. $5 gets you a hot dog, a bag of chips, and a drink. That's a suggested donation. But we want to encourage you to be a part of that after second service today. Help our kids fund their trips to South Dakota and to San Antonio. Last Sunday, we announced our lead pastor candidate, Pastor Kenneth, and there's been a lot of important information that's gone out since then, so please listen carefully, as we don't want anybody to be left in the dark about what's going on. The first thing is that we sent out this very helpful booklet called Introducing Our Lead Pastor Candidate. If you receive our e-news every week, it's linked right there, you can kind of see it on my phone here, okay, and you're going to click this big blue button open it and it's going to download right there on your phone for you that is our preferred way that you pick that up because we don't have enough copies of these for everybody to take one if you don't have access to email these are available in the lobby for you but on the very first page of that document it tells you the schedule for the candidating process and there's a couple of things we want to highlight for you really quickly the first is that on friday this upcoming friday may 20th from 7 to 9 p.m we have a congregational Q&A with Pastor Kenneth. It'll be out in the Kicks building. Refreshments will be provided. That's a chance for you to ask questions about uh, Pastor Kenneth and his transition from worship ministry into lead pastor ministry. We do also want to inc encourage you to read this document in its entirety because he does answer some of those questions already in the booklet. And just to save on hearing the same thing twice, maybe do your homework <laughs> in advance to help with that. We also want to remind you that next Sunday, May 22nd, is our candidating weekend, which means that Pastor Kenneth will be sharing it during both services, and after second service, there's a special called business meeting that we would love for you to be a part of, where we will take a vote on uh, uh, ratifying whether or not Pastor Kenneth will be our next uh, lead pastor here at Parkgate. We do need to have a quorum in order to do that, and so we want to ask you to be a part. If for some reason you need to do an absentee ballot, there's a very specific process that you'll need to read up on in this book, as it's different than our absentee ballot process has worked in the past. As you can see, that took all the pregnant ladies' breath away trying to explain that to you. Hopefully some of it stuck, but it's really, really important. If there's one thing you hear from me this morning, read this book. It's very important for you to be informed as a part of our congregation. We're so grateful to have you here with us this morning. I'll turn it back over to Pastor Kenneth. Took my breath away, too. <laughs> Love information. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so last, uh, yesterday, we had a worship team breakfast with the worship team, and we were just talking about some stuff, and as I was preparing for that breakfast, I was uh, thinking through uh, my worship journey, and I realized that um, Ari and I have been leading worship since for 24 years together. So before we were even dating, this was a part of our our lives, and we've been doing it this that whole time. And uh, one of the things that we love about worship is this unique ability that God has. He has it any time, but there's something special about worship that where He reaches and He touches people's lives. And so there may be an issue going on with a child or with a, a parent. You come into worship, and then God touches something in you. Maybe the situation doesn't change, but he does something in you. Or as we go into worship, he deals with some unforgiveness or bitterness or some anger. He gives you some encouragement and all these types of things. That, that's the beauty of worship. That's the power of worship. And so this morning, we're going to celebrate. We're going to worship our great God. But we also want to remember and realize that God is with us. And he wants to say something to each one of us individually and specifically. And so may we have ears to hear, may we have hearts to receive what God has for us this morning. Would you stand with us? 
And uh, let's, uh, let's begin with prayer and uh, ask that God would uh, bless, this, bless this, these services and our lives. Lord, we come before you and we want to honor you and worship you. Lord, would you speak to us? We know that we are a distracted people. Uh, we maybe I think about what we're going to have for lunch or what's going to happen this week. But for these next few moments, may we press in to the work that you want to do. May we, may we open up our ears so that we can hear from you, Lord. What a shame it would be for us to hear these songs about Jesus, listen to a sermon about Jesus, but not experience Jesus ourselves. May that not be our story this morning, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I know that Jesus is more than something to believe. Seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. Lay your heart out on the line. Seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. And let him fill the void tonight. He's hope everlasting and love never ending. He'll meet you wherever you are. That's right. So seek and you will find. Again, he's something tried.
Mover a mountain. time we would like to enter into a time of prayer. This is something that we do every week because we care about you and uh, we know that life can come at us in all sorts of different directions. And uh, sometimes there's great joy and sometimes there's great hardships and trials. And, and so if you would like prayer, if you would like a little bit of help with whatever you may be going through, maybe you have to make a decision. Maybe there's some stuff on the inside. Maybe there's a, a health issue or a financial need. We'd invite you to come forward during these next couple songs and let us pray with you. Um, you don't have to carry it by yourself. That's the beauty of the church. And God certainly cares about us and what we are going through. So let us pray with you. Once again, if you have a need, please come forward during this next song. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing. The circumstances will change. 
so much for these words that we can say that you rose again on the third day. God, in this we find all of our hope, all of our joy, all of our reason for continuing because we know that you overcame everything already and anything that we deal with today you can overcome as well. God, for those hurts that we have, those concerns, those stresses, these things of life that are just bombarding us and distracting us from you, we ask that you would help us with those. Whatever our need may be, that you would meet those and that we would be able to know that you are there with us. Guide us, Lord. Guide our hearts and lead us to your wonderful light. God, this week as we move into this candidating period, we celebrate the wonderful things that you've already done. We celebrate that you've brought us to this point where we can look forward and we're so grateful to, to you for that, Lord. We ask for abounding wisdom for all of us that you would move in our hearts and move this church to continue to glorify your wonderful name. God, that you would move us to grow and to love others as you have loved us and to make sure that this church remains a beacon of hope in our community. God, we ask that you would be with churches across the world as they struggle with various different things, God, where they're they don't have all the wonderful freedoms that we've been given here, God, but they're still faithful. We ask that you would continue to build them up. For places where there's great unrest and violence, God, we ask that you would calm that and that our sister churches in those areas would be that light in those regions, God, that they wouldn't lose their faith in light of the darkness that they see. God, build us up. Let us be a people for you in all that we do. God, we ask that you would be with Cindy today as she speaks and that you would open our hearts by your spirit to hear what she has to share with us. God, move through us. Make us your people more and more every day in all that we do. Let us always seek to you. Let us seek to you beyond the differences that would separate us, God, because you are the one who can unite us. We thank you so much for your love, Lord. We praise you and we love you. Amen, amen. Please have a seat. Oh, you guys already did. Look at that. <laughs> I'll look up next time. Um, so a couple of, uh, I guess this was a few months ago now, we've got a, uh, I got a, a message from someone in our church who's uh, connected to one of our hospitals. And she said, hey, um, we, the hospitals are looking for some Bibles to hand out to some patients. Some patients are asking for them. Not very many, but a few. And the hospital has no Bibles to hand out. Is that something that the church can help us with? I'm thinking, well, anytime 
somebody ask the church for a Bible. I think we can help with that. And so we were able to get some Bibles together, some new ones, and hand them out. We, um, we have a stack of Bibles that we give out to people who have come to faith or who are new to this Christianity thing. We would like to give them a Bible. So we uh, went through our stack and we gave them to the hospital. A um, couple on a different, with a different story. I've been chatting with a guy uh, who is in prison. And he's been writing me letters, and I've been writing him letters. And every couple weeks or so, he will give me a phone call, and we'll talk. And every time, we'll pray. And one of those conversations, I just asked him, I know you're in prison, but is there something that we can do for you? Is there something that we can help you with? And he gave me a couple of things that would be helpful. And one of the things he said, he said, you know what? I, uh, I don't have a Bible. I have to uh, check it out from the library, but I can only use it for a week or two. And then I have to return it, and I have to wait a while before I can renew it and check it out again. Um, I would love to have a Bible. I said, hey, we can get you a Bible. And so we sent him a Bible, and he gave me a phone call a few weeks later saying, thank you so much for the Bible. I love it. I, I tell those two stories because we could do those things only because of your generosity. Because we had people in the church who gave money that enabled us to purchase these Bibles. And so all the ministries that we do here at Parkgate happen because of your faithfulness, the partnership of the Holy Spirit, and God working through us. And so I want to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for giving. Thank you for blessing this place so that we can be a blessing to our community. If you would like to give this morning, there are boxes in the back, and you can feel free to uh, put a check or money in the boxes. You can give online. You can use our app. There's a number of different ways that you can give. But however you choose to give, thank you for giving. And as Cindy comes, would you guys please turn your attention to the screens? Not this time. Okay. <laughs> All right. I was expecting some music so that I could come up here and sing and dance, I suppose. But <laughs> All right. So words. Words can change a life for the better, for the worse, a future, a dream, an identity, you know, a purpose. When my doctor uttered those four specific words uh, more than 10 years ago now, you have breast cancer. My head started spinning and my mind immediately went into panic mode. I was 49 years old. I thought I was old and they told me I was young. My daughter was only 15 at the time. She was a sophomore in high school, and all of these catastrophic thoughts started plaguing my mind, but the most biggest question that kept coming to my mind was, why? And you know, I don't know that we can fully answer that question, why, but we do know that there's disease in this earth because ever since the fall, ever since the, uh, you know, the, the, the fall in the garden, um, we have seen that answer why? We'll get to that question in just a minute. But for the next 30 minutes, I want to share with you some encouraging words, some healing words, some purpose-filled words. And as you see various words pop up on the screen throughout this message, maybe you could just jot them down and take a, a, a gander at them later and think about which ones resonate with you. It's not just about surviving and thriving with disease, but it's about living our life on purpose for God. There's that word, purpose. Colossians tells us that all things were created by God's Son, which means that I was created by God's Son. If we personalize it, we can say, I was made for Him. I have a purpose. You know, we can't fulfill someone else's purpose. We can only fulfill the purpose that God has for us. So just a quick recap of my journey. 2012, I felt a lump. That's the way the journey often begins. I went to my family doctor. She sent me for an ultrasound. They determined it was a benign mass. Come back in four to six months. And four to six months, five months later, I came back, and this mass had been grown to a nine-centimeter mass, which is about the size of a small grapefruit. She sent me down for a biopsy at this point, and the expression on the radiologist's face as he was doing the biopsy pretty much told it all. Pathology came back, you have breast cancer. She referred me to oncology at MD Anderson. I have to say that I am so thankful that we happen to live in the area where we could go to MD Anderson. 
And I was there at the Woodlands and my oncologist sent me down to downtown because I had skin involvement as well and she wanted to rule out inflammatory breast cancer, which is the worst kind. Well, Dr. Valero at the time was the head of the breast team. I'm not sure if he still is. I was going to look that up. But he has an entourage <laughs> everywhere he goes. Teams of specialists. He has nurses and interns and residents and students and technicians and probably even a janitor or two. They would go in and out of my exam room asking if they could see it, touch it, could they measure it, examine it, take pictures of it, talk about it. It's red, it's hot, it's angry, it's inflamed, it's in the skin. I concur. Well, forget the gown. We might as well just throw that out the window with my modesty. <laughs> there was so much discussion at this point as to whether we had treatment versus cure. Cure, it means that you can remove it, you can radiate it, you can give chemotherapy to it, and you only have a 30% chance that it'll ever come back. Treatment means it's gone to other parts of the body and there's no cure. Well, they came back and said it's not IBS, uh, I mean, um, it's not um, inflammatory breast cancer, it's inv invasive ductal carcinoma, stage 3B out of four stages, and I was triple positive subtype, but it was curable. Whew. I sighed a breath of relief. The tumor was too large to operate, so I had six months of chemotherapy to shrink it, and I had a lot of new experiences at that point. I went to a wig shop for the first time in my life. I also um, experienced a few side effects, one of which is called neutropenia, where your blood counts drop very low so that you can't even fight off infection. One time I ate an undercooked egg or something, and I was so sick that um, the doctor actually said, you need to get here again immediately. It's a matter of life and death. Tim rushed me to the doctor's office. I passed out in her office, and she immediately hospitalized me, and I was there for three days. So it wasn't without its problems. We actually deemed that incident Count Dracula because of my low counts, blood, low blood counts, but also, can you kind of imagine one vampire saying to the other, don't touch the bald ones, their blood tastes awful. <laughs> So, my oncologist actually called me a rock star because in general, I did manage the chemotherapy pretty well. But I told her it was God. I couldn't do it without him. He's the one who gives me strength. Well, my hairstyles have changed drastically throughout the last 10 years, and you'll see some pictures pop up on the screen. It's okay to laugh. Uh, long, short, bald, straight, curly, gray, blonde, brown, covered with scarves, hats, wigs, beanies, you name it. Well, Deborah Darvis in 2006, she's a chaplain and an NPR commentator. She uh, wrote a book titled, It's Not About the Hair. And I thought that was really interesting. I heard what she said on NPR, and she says, that's one of the first things that people ask me when I tell them that I have breast cancer. Are you going to lose your hair? She says, the thing is, it's really not about the hair. It's really about death. People die from cancer all the time, but it's so impolite to say, are you going to lose your life? If we can start talking about life and death issues, maybe when we talk about the hair, it will really be about the hair. I had to wait six months to uh, get surgery, so you can imagine that whole six months, I'm just waiting for the moment when I can have it removed. I was really nervous. Would they get it all? I admit it, I was scared. Um, this was my first major surgery, and I know I'm smiling up there, but it was pretty scary. Um, it occurred to me that I was actually losing a body part, and my surgeon didn't know at that time if she could even get it all because I had skin involvement, and she didn't know if she, she, didn't know if she could close me up. And so um, she had a plastic surgeon on, case just, on, on call just in case. But as the date of my mastectomy drew closer and closer, that question of why kept coming up. Again, we live in a depraved world. Ever since the fall of the Garden of Eden, this earth has been broken. There are weeds in the garden like, you know, trying to choke out those prized vegetables in back of the back uh, of the church back there. Natural disasters like hurricanes and floods are part of the world's brokenness and humans can catch colds and illness and 
you know, viruses and develop cancerous cells, break bones. We can suffer from disabilities and experience all of these different things. But when Jesus encountered the blind man in front of the temple, his disciples in John chapter 9 asked him a why question. Who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents that he was born blind? But Jesus rejected both of those notions. He knows that suffering and sickness and disability and death are in the world because of sin. We find that in Romans chapters 5 and verse and chapter 8. But he rejects the explanation that specific disabilities correspond to specific sins. Instead, Jesus answered, it was not this man or his parents who sinned, but that the glory of God could be displayed through him. Human nature asks why all the time. We seek to strip away the mystery from God. We want to figure it all out logically, scientifically, and lots of TikTok videos out there try to do just this. On a pursuit to answer this why question, I started looking to some heroes in the Bible. And I discovered that Job, a man who had lost everything, his family, his possessions, his material wealth, everything, even his health, asked, why? On multiple occasions, he asked, why have you made me your target? Have I been a burden to you? Then the Lord, not until chapter 38, speaks to him out of the storm. In effect, he said, and I kind of imagine this with a loud, booming voice with the thunder and lightning surrounding, who are you to question me? Now, that's my paraphrase. It doesn't say it exactly like that. But he orated this lengthy lecture about his power and sovereign nature versus Job's puny insight and mortality. I don't know about you, but I don't want a lecture from God. (laughs) I want to trust him, trust his insight, trust his decisions, even if I don't fully understand the reason behind it or even if I don't agree with it. I want him to be glorified. We know he's got this. A friend sent me this picture of Jesus guiding the surgeon's hand just as I was about to go under the knife. And God reminded me to just have faith, knowing that he had it all under control. Well, the surgeon was able to remove my right breast, all the axillary lymph nodes, six sentinel nodes, lots of skin, and she was able to close me up without any assistance. Margins were good. We got it all. I felt peace. Jesus says we're going to have to suffer while we're in the world, but he brings us peace. Cheer up. I also felt loved. After surgery, um, I had 33 rounds of radiation every day, or 33 rounds of daily radiation, I should say. (laughs) Marathon, not a sprint, my doctor said. So it's, it's really daunting when you're laying on that table with the, you know, pose position, and um, they have this three to six foot concrete vault door that closes behind you, and you're inside this vault all by yourself. So as I was laying there every single day, I would find things to be thankful for, and I thanked God for my family and for just making it this far, I was so grateful. I was thankful for my husband um, who got me up every morning and took me on the motorcycle. My, my um, radiation was early in the morning and he would take me on the bike so that we could watch the sunrise so that I wouldn't have to dread. I'd have something to look forward to instead. And I was thank- thankful for my son as well who came on the very last day when I was able to ring that bell and say, treatment is done. I have to say, I was a bit emotional that day, and I cried another sigh of relief. Well, because of my skin involvement and the type of uh, cancer I had, I had to wait six months to even start the whole reconstruction process, and by now it was April 2014. But I only had one option. It's called a deep flap, and that's where they take your tummy tissue, and I had lots of people offer their tummy tissue (laughs) at the time. And they form a breast from that, and then they do microsurgery to connect the blood vessels. So it's a very complex process. Um, I had to stay in ICU for um, for a week, and then I had eight weeks of, sur- of uh, recovery after that. 
So it's a little, not a little, it was a lot harder than the mastectomy itself. But I'm glad I did it. I had three more surgeries that year to complete the process. You know, Romans 5.3 tells us to rejoice in trials because they lead to endurance and strength of character. So one character building um, incident that happened is about a week after I had gotten out of the hospital and I was recovering from my deep flap, I was walking like this because I had just lost half of my tummy. <laughs> And I, I, I had, my hair had just started growing back. And when you have chemo, it comes back curly. Uh, they call it chemo curls. And it was gray and curly. And I have to say, I, was, I looked a lot older than what I am. And so I'm walking like this, and my neighbor was out. We had just gotten back. We had only walked to the corner and back, and we're getting into the, walking into the driveway. And she comes out. She's with her boys, and she says, isn't that sweet? my boys are out here riding their bikes with their mom, and you're out here walking with your mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I told her, talk to the hand, and I just kept on walking. About a week later, she shows up on my front door with flowers. So <laughs> I think she figured out I wasn't his mom. <laughs> Speaking of moms, we just celebrated Mother's Day. I was four weeks into my recovery with four weeks to go. My mother had a melanoma, she learned earlier that year, and it had that, at this point metastasized to her lungs. Now, I learned a lot from my mom about living a life full of adventure, even when the chips were down and she was mugged or she was, you know, we were homeless or whatever the case was, she saw it as an adventure and she was a, an encourager. So when the doctor told her, and I was there when he told her, you don't have any, there's nothing else we can do. She probably had a couple of weeks left to live. She looked at me and she looked at the doctor and with a smile on her face, she said, I get to go be with my Jesus. I get to go be with my Jesus. As her vigilant caregiver, we lived together in hospice house for the last 16 days of her life. And here she was on her deathbed, still uh, teaching me. Up until this point, I was afraid of the process of dying. But as I watched her go through it, I realized that hospice workers are great people. You know, she graciously taught me about transitioning from this life to our eternal home. Hospice people are wonderful. The hospice chaplain said she puts sugar to shame. I learned that when my day arrives, there are going to be people to take care of me. It's a beautiful thing going to our eternal home. And I hope that one day I can repeat, I get to go be with my Jesus. A famous philosopher said, clouds come floating into my life. No longer to carry the rain or usher storm, but to add color to my sunset sky. Look for the color. Look for the beauty that accompanies each cloud in your life. Well, a couple of years later, my hair had grown back out. I had published a book of stories by women with breast cancer, and we were speaking um, about, I was speaking about my journey and encouraging other women who were newly diagnosed. I was back to work full time. Um, both of our kids were now married and having kids of their own and starting their families, and life goes back to normal, right? I was kind of feeling like my old self again. Well, fast forward, December 2016, four years after my original diagnosis, I was feeling some pain around my left rib cage. I thought maybe it was muscular, but I had heard some popping and cracking and wondered what that was all about. And as it turned out in the x-ray and all of the tests they did, I had a seven centimeter mass on my rib cage. Same kind I had before, triple positive, very aggressive subtype. It had actually obliterated two of my ribs, <laughs> and it was pressing against my lung. Well, that kind of explains the popping and cracking, I guess. <laughs> lung biopsy confirmed. So once you have uh, breast cancer, and this is true of any cancer, by the way, um, when it spreads and shows up in another part of the body, they no longer call it, I mean, they don't call it something different. They still call it breast cancer, but it's metastatic at this point because it has metastasized to another part of your body. This time it wasn't in the breast. I was grateful for that. I didn't want to lose another body part. But you know what? Women don't die from a tumor in the breast. 
We die when it spreads to other parts of the body, and then we can no longer receive treatment to stop it from progressing. That's that whole treatment versus cure that I talked about earlier. Well, it was in my ribs, my spine, my skull, my liver, and my lungs. And surgery is no longer an option. Stage four, that's the highest stage, metastatic breast cancer. But aside, we really shouldn't press God for a timeline because God is not controlled by our timeline, right? But, you know, we kind of wanted to know how much energy would I have, how long would it be, blah, blah, blah. And so one of the PAs took the bait, and she said probably nine months, maybe 18 at the outside. Well, that was December, just after Christmas in 2016. <laughs> yeah, you're doing the math in your head, so she was obviously wrong, right? There's always hope. We had friends from all over the U.S. come and, buy, uh, come and uh, visit us that year to remind us of the hope that's in Christ. Cancer is not the big C. Cancer is a little C. Jesus Christ is the big C. We have to remember that. Yeah. There's a song we've sung it here by uh, Mercy Me called Even If, and it says, I know you're able and I know you can basically save me with your mighty hand, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. So I started treatment again, this time for stage four. They hit me hard after they installed my new port, had several months of chemotherapy again. I lost my hair again and uh, went through scans, doctors, specialists, blah, 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 all of that. And they also put me on targeted Im immunotherapy every three weeks, which I now go in for an infusion every three weeks for the rest of my life. They keep saying, we don't know when we should stop it, but we might be ever treating you, but we'll just keep on going. After three rounds of chemotherapy, that mass on my rib cage, gone. Gone. My doctor said it looked like someone had scraped the ribs, you can actually see where it had been scraped. And I'm like, I know who that someone is. <laughs> Those ribs that were obliterated were now intact. Did you know that our ribs are the one bone in our body that can actually regenerate themselves? Maybe that's why God chose the ribs from Adam, who knows. But anyway, um, <laughs> subsequent scans found no um, spots in my liver, my lungs, my body was completely clear. Undetectable, no progression from that point forward. No progression in my body, that is. They treat the body and the brain a little bit differently. And two years later, that NBC roller coaster continues. And I was feeling dizziness. And anytime you have any kind of symptom, they send you for a scan. So January 2019, they sent me for an MRI of the brain. And I am happy to report that I have a brain. <laughs> I'm not a scarecrow, <laughs> contrary to some people's opinion. But the MRI found three lesions in my brain. And uh, I used to think that brain lesions were an immediate death sentence, but I've since learned that there's lots of hope, even for brain lesions. Basically, I got to experience another type of treatment called gamma knife. There's not really a knife involved, but what they do is um, they, they put this crown on your head and they screw it into your skull and then they put you in the MRI machine. And the reason this thing is connected to your head is so that you can't move even one millimeter to the side because it's a very precise and accurate measurement of where that spot is that they're going to attack. And there's about 200 low-level beams of radiation that come in as a kind of an inverted starburst. Each one of them is benign pretty much on their own, but all of them together, they explode, and then they move your head and they hit the next one, and they move your head and hit the next one. Treatment doesn't hurt. I'm smiling in this picture, but right after she turned that phone around and took my picture and showed me the picture, I had a major meltdown. <laughs> so it's not all smiles, it's not all fun and games. But I did end up on top because that was my very last progression. That was January of 2019, stable, you can call it remission, no active disease, no evidence of active disease. 18 months, <laughs> here I am. Five years later, three years since the gamma knife. So God is not a God of statistics. So how do we cope? How do we deal with bad news? How do we find stability? Because not everybody's story is the same as mine, right? Not everybody has that 
five-year remission or five-year um, stability? How do we cope with the constant threat of death or disability? Well, when I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, I began dealing with it differently than I did the first time. I did not go into panic mode this time. I went into reflection and evaluation mode. Psychologists tell this happens in the elderly, in midlife. Sometimes I feel a bit elderly, so it kind of fits. Um, but for example, when I was preparing this message, it occurred to me that the gamma knife, where they have these starbursts that come together, is like the power of the unity of believers. If all of us have a single focus to eradicate the enemy, and we're all working together with precision and accuracy to laser focus on the enemy, we can eradicate the enemy, and we can meet whatever purpose God has for this church. Amen? So, Philippians tells us, complete my joy being the same mind, having the same love, being full accord of one mind. So we reevaluate our life choices and decisions. We reevaluate who we are in the church. We think about how we can serve others with the life I have left. So every three weeks when I get that infusion and I'm sitting there in the chair, I do that. I think about, you know, what you know, what, what does God have for me as I blog, read scripture, draw, um, tell, sto tell my story, how to encourage others. And what I've come to realize is that if one person, if one benefits from my borrowed time here on earth, it'll be worth it all. It'll be worth it all. Well, Tim and I began taking John 10.10 10 more seriously. We downsized and began to prepare for my early retirement. We wanted to do more life and ministry together, like we're doing here. We wanted to check off a few more bucket list items, and we made that official just before the pandemic hit. Someone asked me what I do now that I'm retired, and I am plenty busy, I have to tell you, but I'm gonna borrow somebody else's idea when they get bored, you know. So when I get bored, I'm going to uh, call in sick to places that I don't work. <laughs> So tomorrow I'm going to get written up at Walmart. <laughs> My husband and I laugh. We laugh a lot. You know, it's another way we cope. Um, John 15, 11 tells us that he wants us to feel joy. Weird attracts weird, so that's why he and I kind of get each other. He knows how to break the tension of a serious situation at just the right moment. So some people may think, oh, you're making fun of cancer, but in reality, he is giving me hope and helping me to have something fun rather than being constantly dreading situations. For example, one way he shows love is uh, this joke. It's kind of an on -joke, ongoing joke with us. He says, if I go first, he's going to go after Jennifer Aniston because he needs the money. <laughs> if he goes first... I'm going after nobody. <laughs> I'm too old to train another one. <laughs> so ask God to bring laughter into your life. Memorize and recite scriptures like the one you see on the screen. Find the silver lining. You know, there are actually some benefits to being diagnosed with a disability, such as stage four or other disabilities. Um, the government is giving, my, giving me my hard-earned Social Security a few years early, so they didn't even question it when the doctor put terminal on my uh, application. They probably aren't planning on me living through retirement because they don't know my God, but I'm going to just keep on living and enjoying retirement early. Award-winning author Barbara Johnson was diagnosed with a brain tumor in early 2000, and while battling her illness, she wrote several books, but one which said, Plant a geranium in your cranium, sprouting seeds of joy in the manure of life. <laughs> life brings us a lot of manure, right? It stinks. But we can laugh. We can find joy in Christ, no matter how bad it may seem. So we laugh, we play, and we ride. I bought a new Harley Davidson. I don't know if you guys know that we ride motorcycles, but I bought a new Harley Davidson Heritage Classic to celebrate the completion of my gamma knife treatment, and I named her Free because she was reminding me I'm free in Christ, free from cancer. We, had ri we have actually ridden in all 48 states as well as Canada, so we have checked off our bucket list. People often say they live vicariously through us, but I would challenge you to ask Christ to live vicariously through you. 
Well, we recently sold those motorcycles to devote more time traveling in our Airstream. People with disabilities actually get a lifetime pass to um, all of the national parks in America. If you didn't know that or if someone with a disability you know doesn't know that, tell them about it. It's called America the Beautiful, so we can go to remote locations that we can't go with the bikes, but we can enjoy the creation that God has given us. So we're enjoying time together, and, and we're serving. I've served the church. I've lived through 10 Christmases since my original diagnosis. Okay. So I accidentally closed my document. That's not very helpful. <laughs> I could just do it from, uh, from memory, but, you know, it might last a lot longer if I did. So <laughs> we're almost done. Um, I've lived to be a grandmother. God is good. We have five grandchildren, age seven and under, and another one on the way in July. Uh, I, ha I say all this to, to demonstrate the power of God, not to boast or you know, puff myself up, but he's the one who gives me strength to live life abundantly. Like Paul, who had a thorn in the flesh, a very serious one, I've had to learn to be content regardless of the circumstances. So Barbara Johnson, you know the lady with the geranium and the cranium, she um, inspired me in more than one way. She inspired me to laugh. She also inspired me to write because I thought, hey, if she can write four books at the end of her life, hers are bestsellers, mine probably won't be, but if she can write four books, then I can surely do that as well. Last year I published my first children's book and I'm working on a couple of more. I want to see kids accomplish the dreams that God has for them. I know Pastor Chelsea can appreciate that. This book is an entree into schools and other venues, um, an opportunity to connect with children and families and share a scripture with them whenever I sign the book. Children need to hear encouraging words like, you can do it. And I thought, you know what, if they can say a big word like onomatopoeia, if they can learn how to read some of these big words, maybe they'll feel a sense of accomplishment and then they can begin to believe that they can do it. We can do it, but it does require faith. My faith has actually expanded in the last 10-year journey, and I've had a much greater respect for God's perspective now than I even did before. His vision is not myopic. He doesn't see through this tiny crack in time and space like we do, but he sees the whole picture. He sees the past, the present, the future, and he's everywhere. He knows everything about all people all the time. So while he could change our immediate circumstance, he has a reason for not always doing so. We may not ever apprehend why. I have met Christians who believe that if you just have faith, you will be, sa you will be healed. In other words, lack of healing equates to lack of faith. But I have read stories in the Bible where people were not healed or did not avoid death or suffering and yet their faith was strong to the very end. Consider the first Christian martyr, Stephen. He looks up to heaven and said, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He was witnessed by Saul. And the, the, the death of Stephen fueled the Christian movement. John the Baptist, another example. Even Jesus begged for the cup to be removed from him. But it didn't prevent him from dying. Based on these examples, <laughs> it does not make sense to me that one's faith is equal to getting what we want or what we think is best for us. There must be a greater good in life, in suffering, in death. Through my own faith journey, I've come to accept that faith means trusting him regardless of the outcome. So as we wrap up this morning, I want to challenge you with a couple of questions. Number one, where is your faith? If you don't know him, now is a good place to start. If you do know him, maybe your faith has been challenged today. Maybe you've encountered a disease or difficulty that's affected you or someone that you know, someone that you love. Maybe someone's even passed away because of an illness. Maybe this has caused some doubt or challenged your faith. And I challenge you to start today trusting him regardless of the outcome. It's also hard to hear God's purpose if we don't have that faith foundation. So the second question is, are you living life to the fullest potential that God has given you? 
Take some time this week to reevaluate God's purpose for you. You know, Larry said a few weeks ago that it doesn't matter how old you are. He still has a purpose for your life. This might be a day-by-day -day challenge, but consider what your purpose is every day. Are you living life with no regrets, no take-backs? Someone famous said, you might think of excuses like, it's too hard, I don't know where to start, I'm sick, I'm tired, I'm broke, I'm busy. But the good news is that your mission is always possible when God is involved. Jesus defeated death, and because we serve a God who has rattled the gates of hell and trampled over death, you can fulfill whatever he has called you to do. Jesus didn't say, I came that you may have a ho-hum mundane vanilla life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it in abundance. Remember, you are still here for a reason. And if one person benefits from your borrowed time on earth, it's worth the investment. Thanks, Mary. And so one of the ways that we celebrate this abundant life is through communion. And so we're going to have an extended time of communion this morning where we're going to sing a couple songs. And at any time during these two songs, maybe you want to come up during the first one, maybe the second one, but you can grab the elements. Please take them back to your seats and then have a conversation with God. Ask Him what your purpose is. What is the one person that God wants you to reach out and touch and then when you're ready, you can take the elements by yourself. So once again, you can take communion during the first song or the second song. It's up to you. But spend some time praying and reflecting on what God would have you do.
Would you stand with us for this last song? We're going to celebrate and sing about the goodness of God. you pray with me. And so, Lord, we thank you for those small gifts that sometimes we take for granted, like laughter, those things that we can do when those hard times come, when we have other people to lift us up and to encourage us, we have places where we can go. And we just want to, we thank you for that, Lord. We know that this is a, a sensitive subject that we've talked about today. But ultimately, we trust if you are God of the soul, you are also God of the body. And so we want to say that we love you and we trust you. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, please have a seat for just a moment. Uh, we hope that this has been encouraging to you and that you have something that you could take away and say, this is something that I'm going to do because I was here uh, today. As we say every week, you have Lots of opportunities to bless people and to point people to Jesus, to bring a little laughter, a little hope, a little bit of light into dark places. And I hope that you will make the most of those opportunities. And let's remind ourselves of why we do it by reciting this verse together. This is how we know what love is. 
Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Love God, love people, love now. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.